prepared questions, and then we can throw it out to you guys. Um, so, um, let's see. So, Doug, <laughs> you're first up. Digital Domain has reinvented itself multiple times, and now you're an Academy Award winning studio servicing almost every part of the film and television production pipeline. You also have a very active research group focused specifically on the topic at hand today. Can you tell us a bit about the driving force behind forming an entire group dedicated to digital humans? Sure. Um, um, before I do that, uh, Simon did a plug. I'm going to do a plug too. Uh, you may be wondering why I'm not Digi Doug right now. Um, the Digi Doug requires a lot of hardware and stuff, and all that's downstairs in Paul B. And we're going to be doing Digi Doug Part Two uh, for Real Time Live. So if you're interested in seeing some cool new stuff that you haven't seen here, uh, come to Real Time Live tomorrow at six o'clock at uh, in Hall B. And remember, Real Time Live gets packed as packed as this kind of place. So um, at Digital Domain, um, I've been running. We've always had an R and D group. You know, we hell we wrote new right and. Uh, um, the, for the longest time, we've had a small R&D group that's been really trying to drive things forward. Um, five years ago, I read a machine learning paper, and I basically said, oh, this is cool, I want to do this. And I, I started telling our software people, if you're not doing it with machine learning, you're doing it wrong. Um, and we've been really pushing our software group towards that. And the timing just kind of worked out. So uh, for digital humans, we've gotten really good at doing some stuff. We started using some machine learning techniques to, to really push this. This started really with Maleficent, and then uh, Thanos came along and we we're like, whoa, this is really cool. And, and then it just went bonkers. And we, we started getting you know, some really good results, and we pivoted ourselves. So our software team is now, it's, it's almost like digital domain is turning into a software company where we're we're building stuff to create these digital humans, but we're doing visual effects on the side. Uh, although, don't tell the 800 people who are working at Digital Domain that. It's, at least from my perspective, we're having a lot of fun. So a lot of the technology that we're doing for film is just going straight into, wow, we could do this in real time. And then that is turning around and coming right back into film. Uh, so it's very exciting. It's, I'm having a blast. Uh, I hope you can tell. Okay. We can totally tell you're super enthusiastic. I actually remember last year at the Infinity War panel, Ke Kelly Port talking about how they use machine learning with Thanos. And uh, now, one thing you—I'm I'm going off script now. Um, one of the things you mentioned in your five-minute intro was how um, you're using machine learning to actually get to get results quicker and faster than you could potentially if you threw it back into animation. I remember last year in the panel, Kelly talking about how the, it, it did require animator input to sort of refine the retargeting, but maybe, maybe uh, you can explain that a little bit better and that as time went on, the machine learning uh, capture, I suppose, or algorithm start to understand how uh, animators were tweaking the retargeted performance to make it feel more real or feel more like Thanos or what, whatever that means. Um, and that's how, over time, that they could go faster and faster, but maybe you could embellish a little bit. Sure. Well, there's two aspects to that. And the first aspect, and I think Simon and Vlad will come right in on this, is that deep learning sort of turns the way you look at problems. Uh, it used to be, especially when you're doing physics or something like that, it's all about the equations. It's all about, and I am getting to your answer, it's, a, it's about how to do it. Well, deep learning turns it into how do I get the data and how do I make sure that the data looks good, right? And then the algorithms for deep learning, are, it's kind of surprisingly simple, right? I mean, once you've got the data, you, you get your PyTorch or TensorFlow thing, and all of a sudden it's like this much code and it does crazy amazing things. The key thing is getting the data. And all of a sudden you start thinking about writing code to make sure that the data is correct. Vlad is labeling the crap out of his data. And that is weird. It's like, I'm not programming, I'm labeling. But you are programming. You're writing a lot of code to make sure that the labeling comes correct. So getting back to Thanos, that was exactly where the artists come in. With a, we got all this data from Bra um, Josh Brolin. 
And we spent a lot of time up front making sure that that data was, well, and this is where the artists were really important. So the artists came through and made sure that any data that we got from Josh wasn't screwy looking or something, because screwy looking data can get in and start messing with the machine. It'll learn screwy, and that is bad news, and it's really hard to unlearn that once it's in there. And then also, the second part of that is especially for film production. When you're building these pieces of software, you cannot forget the ability to change. For real time, we want something that just looks at my image and creates the digital character. Boom, it's, it's just a pipeline, there's no time. But for Thanos, once we built this thing that understood how Josh's face moves and how it moves on to um, Thanos itself, we're also stuck in things along the way so that artists could change the performance, but we still had to do that. And that, that was actually a bit of a trick. That's something you have to slide in and you have to sort of say, no, 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 we want to have the control. We want to manipulate this. Um, and yeah, we can, I can talk a lot about Yeah, I mean, well, is. when you think about Thanos specifically or any sort of humanoid character, it's not going to have the exact same facial proportions that a, like a real human would. So the retargeting out of the gate might be a little bit weird. Right. Um, so that's why you have to have animators maybe either make things, um, you know, a, a larger performance or a smaller performance, probably de depending on where on the face it is. So. Probably, it makes sense to me that you need a little bit of time to sort of capture how that retargeting actually works as a performance, and then eventually it can start to drive it. Right. Cool. Um, okay, so I have another question for you, Doug. Um, what are the primary challenges you're tackling with your work on digital humans? Well, like I said in the um, like I said in the presentation, it's it's trying to make it look as real as possible. And uh, to take away that, I mean, just look at the TED talk, right? The, the, at the, uh, I, I, milk in it, I promise. <laughs> but at the very beginning, you see my face, and it looks really, it's good, right? It's a close up, and it looks really amazing. But there's some motion that looks, there's a little bit of the motion of the head that just doesn't look right to me. I don't know what's, how, this is the hard thing. It's the details. And, um, and this is where, Artists are extraordinarily important because the, ability, the the really good artists and Daniel, you know this, and you are one. I mean, you look at something, and really good artists can tell you how to fix it, and that's one of the things that we're. It's so fun to be in a crowd of people at a visual effects company who can point out to say, no, 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 the eye needs to open up a little bit wider or something. The challenge with Digi Doug for yourself, I mean, I would have probably picked like a supermodel avatar personally. I would have been like something that doesn't look anything like me because what happens with you is you can do an A-B comparison real time and then people can actually be more critical of Digi Doug if they want it to be. If it was something completely different, uh, then actually it's a little bit more forgiving. Well, we did this on purpose accident. So the, basically we decided to do this and we said, hey, we need somebody, we need access, we don't want, uh, we, we actually thought about using an actor, but it would have been pain in the butt to haul the actor in, and actors are really sensitive about who owns their data. And I was like, sure, you can do me. Uh, and uh, I didn't realize the implications of all this, but it was also very scary because of exactly that. We, you can do an A-B comparison, and you can look at my face, and you can go, wait, whoa, wait, whoa, wait, this is wrong. But that's what we're using. This is. This is all R&D for us. This is all something, but you know, once it gets out there, we're gonna want to be able to have you create your own avatar and not go, why does that look like an emoji? And so, yeah. Cool. All right, Doug. Um, one last question. There are numerous ways that AI is being explored at DD. How has AI helped either with visual quality or with accelerating your production pipeline? Ah, uh, well. So we're using AI, and I'm pointing to Simon here because he's gonna be happy with this, for uh, clothing simulation, muscle simulation, face, the whole face pipeline has gone, well, and not AI, machine learning. AI is different. Um, we're using machine learning for clothing simulation, muscle simulation, um, uh, all the face stuff. We're just starting to look at AI for hair, so don't ask me about that, because I don't know how to do hair. Um, oh, and by the way, no. 
By the way, if somebody knows how to use machine learning to do the tongue in this audience, <laughs> grab me. The tongue befuddles us. We, we do not have, know how to do the tongue except have an animator animate the tongue. That's a, that's a tricky one. Do you have that? Ah, oh, it's how you can do it. <laughs> it's one of those sneaky things. You, you can see it ever so slightly. It's just there, right? It's just there. And if it isn't moving correctly, people are okay with it, but unless you see that time. So we're using machine learning to do all this. And like I said in my talk, basing everything about using machine, um, the cool thing about machine learning is you can tell it to get better. And this is stuff that we're just starting to explore. When we have something that renders as well as DigiDug, and we have a bazillion images of my face, can we start using that and there are things like differentiable rendering. This is a big thing, right? Where you can actually have a renderer where you can basically say, hey, can I take the derivative of you? And it will. This is, this is an amazing thing. And then there's things like reinforcement learning that Simon is doing. And now we can start applying that to people. So um, this, is, this is all really exciting stuff where we can make the machine learn how somebody looks. And especially when we get down to the small details, it's very important. I'm going to give you one more sneaky question because you brought it up and it sort of piqued my curiosity. Can you do a quick definition for me of like what the difference between machine learning and AI is? Machine, machine learning is a very, very compact little area of AI. AI is this great big thing about creating intelligent, artificial intelligence. And that includes all sorts of uh, technology like expert systems and just a bazillion other things that machine learning is just one chunk of that. But at the very core, machine learning is just interpolation. You, you put an input in and an output spits out. And that crazy, that output is super nonlinear, which is why we're using it for the face, because the face is very nonlinear. And it looks magical, but at its core, it's just transformations that take this thing over into that. And it is not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a much, much bigger topic. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, um, Simon, you're on the you're in the hot chair now. I got a couple questions for you. Um, Nvidia has done a lot of work with regard to audio-driven facial animation and human locomotion. Can you tell us more about what is possible today using AI? So, I think within these two categories, you can. Um, Locomotion, I think, is something we've been working on for a while, so you can simulate uh, crowd peaking. Um, because uh, within NVIDIA, we have our robotic simulation and also our autonomous uh, vehicle simulation. So to train those uh, networks for the cars, we want to be able to have a realistic environment that you know, if, if a mother is pushing a baby over across the street, then we, we, so the network would be know how to react to that. Or the difference between a uh, policeman, you know, stopping traffic versus uh, just a biker raising their hands. Um, they're they're actually really hard problems. So we're trying to use a lot of this to simulate um, a lot of uh, human locomotion type uh, behaviors. Um, and in, in terms of the audio driven uh, facial animation, we think it's it's a big topic. Um, a lot of entertainment uh, related work plus. There's, there's new fields, like digital influencers, um, avatars that would love to have, uh, just based on audio, have a very fairly realistic face. So we're continually pushing on that. So. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, tell us about full body animation using video-based performance capture or other markerless systems. When will systems like this start to take hold? Right now, uh, we're also using this kind of system. Um, imagine if you have a, a vehicle, um, and there's sensors, that's just cameras watching around. You have to be able to tell where the people are. So a lot of the post estimation started from a branch called the computer vision. Being able to tell um, and derive uh, you know, some skeleton of the people walking around. Um, but it's also very hard because if you see a person face on, you can kind of define their limbs, but they turn aside, everything gets occluded. So that's where deep learning helps a lot. 
So you train enough data that you can actually approximate, oh, that's kind of what they're doing. 